This program is about unsolved mysteries. Whenever possible, the actual family members and police officials have participated in recreating the events. What you are about to see is not a news broadcast. Vietnam. A wounded helicopter pilot was taken to a hospital with a fractured skull, shattered legs, and possible brain damage. Twenty years later, Jim Mead is trying to find the heroic nurse who saved his life. In 1947, a strange craft crashed in a remote New Mexico field. The metal debris had startling property and was covered with unusual markings. Witnesses claim it was a UFO. The military here at Roswell Army Air Base in New Mexico immediately announced that the object was a UFO. And within hours, changed their story and said it was only a downed weather balloon. Did the military conceal the most astounding discovery of the century? Join me tonight for the season premiere of Unsolved Mysteries. Last season, 34 cases, profiled and unsolved mysteries were solved, thanks to information from our viewers. One recent case was that of Charles Muley, a 10-year veteran of the Slidell, Louisiana Police Department, who disappeared over three years ago while free on bail. On March 1st, 1985, Muley was arrested by fellow officers in a local motel room where he allegedly molested a 12-year-old girl. At the time of his arrest, he was a sergeant in charge of sexual offenses for the Slidell Police Department. His alleged victim was a young girl he was assigned to counsel. If Your Honor, please, considering the serious gravity on of September the... On September 27, 1985, Charles Muley was indicted on over 25 counts relating to the molestation and rape of six young girls. He was released on $150,000 bail. Eight months later, on the morning that his trial was to begin, Muley was reported missing. Five days later, a fisherman believed he saw Muley emerging from a swamp near Slidell. This was closely followed by a second sighting. This witness was shot at by a man dressed in hospital clothing, a favorite outfit of Muley's. We were convinced more than ever that Charles was alive that uh, he was in this area and he had not moved far from this area. For more than three years, Charles Muley's whereabouts have remained a mystery. Up to Charles Muley has been captured. Within minutes of our July broadcast, the FBI received several calls from viewers who reported that Muley was living in Ocala, Florida, 30 miles south of Gainesville under the assumed name Joseph John Tranchina. Muley had seen our broadcast and left the Ocala area for approximately three weeks. When he returned on August 3rd, he was arrested by FBI agents and Marion County, Florida Sheriff's deputies. For the first time, helicopters played a pivotal role, the crucial lifeline between base camps and the soldiers in the field. The skill and bravery of a helicopter pilot meant the difference between life and death, freedom and captivity. A pilot's chance of being killed was nine times greater than any other soldier's. And one out of every eight helicopter pilots in Vietnam lost his life. These pilots truly were heroes. But there was another group of heroes in the Vietnam War, a group who remained largely unsung. 
Those heroes were the skilled and patient military nurses who dealt with the wreckage of young bodies brought back from the front and struggled to return those battered soldiers to a normal life. This section of the National Cemetery at Arlington, Virginia is dedicated to nurses slain in battle as one of the few memorials we have in the United States honoring them. Tonight we tell the story of an Army helicopter pilot whose life was salvaged by a nurse, Lieutenant Betty Stevens. For 15 years he's been searching for her, but mysteriously there is no record of where she went. What he wants to say are the simple but eloquent words, thank you. Perhaps someone watching tonight can help him. In 1965, 18-year-old Jim Meade Jr. gave up a promising college career and volunteered to serve in Vietnam. We tried to talk him out of it. The professors at the University of Oregon tried to talk him out of it. Finish college and then go. And the war will still be there after you finish college. But he was determined and he went. Jim won his wings as an Army helicopter pilot in the winter of 1967. It didn't surprise me to see him want to give time to his country and being in helicopters and being in the rescue mission and what have you, these were all uh, part of Jim. Jim served in Vietnam for only three months, transporting troops to and from combat missions. Twice Jim was shot down, twice he went back. On May the 8th, 1967, he was shot down for the third time. This time, Jim Meade would not be able to go back. On May the 9th, 1967, Jim's parents received a vaguely worded telegram saying their son had been placed on the seriously ill list because of a fractured skull. He was transferred to Madigan General Hospital in Tacoma, Washington. We don't have a room for him yet. We'll let you know as soon as possible. Mm, thank you. Jim's mother and father, along with two of his brothers, waited in the hospital lobby. Jim had not yet been assigned a room. His family had no idea what to expect. It was quite difficult for me to just sit and relax and wait till they came and said, to tell us that Jim was, had been put in a room. So myself and uh, two sons, I got up, I said, I'm gonna walk down the hallway for a while. I just can't sit here and wait. And there's miles and miles of hallway in Madigan General Hospital. And as I was walking down the hallway, here in the hallway was a gurney. There was a soldier on the gurney, and uh, he, had, he had bandages all over him, bandages in the head, legs in cash, tubes, and bottles. So I said to the other boys, the two sons, I said, boy, that soldier just tore all the hell. Uh, and after a while then, uh, the nurse came to us and said, okay, we have your son in a room. Uh, come go with me. We went into that room, and here was that gurney. That guy that was tore all to hell was my son. Beyond recognition. And there was nothing we could do. That was a, that was a terrible thing. That there was nothing that we could do. Jim, it's mom. It was just unbelievable. He didn't look like himself, you know. And of course, he had all these tubes in him and all of these things. I worked in an emergency room, and I've seen a lot of things, but I don't think I have seen anything as horrible as my son was. Jim was in a coma. The helicopter rotor blade had fractured his skull. He made only animal-like sounds and flailed his arms involuntarily. Both of his legs had been shattered and were riddled with gangrene. Jimmy? The doctors feared that Jim would never come out of his coma. 
As a last resort, they assigned him to a ward with amputees who had served in Vietnam. The doctors asked the men to talk to Jim and act as if he could hear them. On the slim chance that the constant exposure to other people might trigger a response. Jim, what do you want to play now? I beat everyone at gin, poker, now you want to play blackjack? <laughs> the experiment worked. After 10 weeks in the war, Jim came out of his coma. He had no memory of his first 19 years. Jim had even forgotten how to talk and how to move his arms and legs. I didn't know that I'd been a helicopter pilot. I didn't know I'd been to Vietnam. I didn't know that I'd been injured so seriously. Uh, I didn't know anything. It was like a whole new world. Happily, Jim Meade continued to heal. Neither of his legs was amputated. Today, he's 42 years old and has made a miraculous recovery. Jim feels it is due in large part to the dogged determination of his nurse, Lieutenant Betty Stevens, who literally brought him back to life and who, for one crucial year, was the most important person in his life. Nice and flat. There you go. All right, now start with this hand and this leg. Ready? There you go. Good. Grip that mat. Feel the mat. Keep your legs straight. Keep your legs straight. There you go. To learn how to walk. Come on. Good. Keep I first going. had to learn how to crawl. Keep going. Lieutenant Stevens Come would get on. down on the mat with me. There you go. And be right next to me. Flat. Show me. There you go. Because Come I didn't on. have any coordination between my arms, legs, okay. and the commands from my brain. And so at the beginning, she would work on me and teach me how to Good. crawl. Okay, now we're gonna go the and, uh, and she would show me how there. to do it. Good. Good. I remember one time in particular, there were some basic trainees who had sprained ankles or whatever okay. and were in the hospital and were in physical Good. therapy. Okay, get your legs a little bit further apart. There you go. And on. one time, <laughs> or after a series of, of times, uh, falling on my there face, he started straight. laughing at me. Look like a turtle, man. <laughs> and I remember her getting so angry. What gives you the right to laugh at him? That is a person who has been at war. He's trying to learn things that are very easy for you. Now I want you both out of here right now. Come on, get out. And just the way she yelled at them and kicked them out, because she was so mad. It meant a lot to me. It just made me want to do what she wanted me to learn to do. But I was in so much pain that the people couldn't take me out of bed. She would even come down and ask me how I was doing. And I was in so much pain that I was really crying. I know you're hurting, but you can't give up. And she responded that she knew that I was hurting. Getting stronger. The more you exercise, the stronger you're going to get, and the less it's going to hurt. The most important thing that I remember, she held my hand, and I was just showing her concern and her caring that made me want to get better. Don't give up. To want to learn to walk, to want to learn to feed myself, to want to learn things like how to shave, how to comb my hair. Now straighten it out. Come on, work hard, come on. Pick it up. There you go. Pull, there you I go. I don't know if I would have learned Ready? to do these things without her. There you go. Oh, bring it up, work I might hard. have eventually come learned just out of the sheer survival factor. But she made it important for me to withstand the pain and frustration Straighten it out. Up. Put your hands around it like that. Put your hand around that. Good. Push. Work. Good. 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 Good job. There. Here he is. Hi, Jim. Because of her patient load, Lieutenant Stevens could give Jim physical therapy for only one hour each day. She felt he would benefit from going home for 30 days to work with his parents around the clock. We could have gone as far as we did with Jim without her supervision. There are certain things in physical therapy that you can do more harm than good. And so therefore, her as the professional was showing 
us how to do it the right way. There we go. We're going to play ball today. For 12 grueling hours each day, Jim's parents try to improve his motor skills and teach him how to talk, all under the guidance of Lieutenant Stevens. Can you roll it back to me? Come on, back here. Even Wonderful. when I wasn't in the hospital, when I was home with my parents on calm bus and leave, I always wanted to get better and learn things so I could go back to the hospital and show her how much I'd improved. It was always important to me. Jim. Nearly one year after Jim had first arrived at the hospital, mm -hmm. Lieutenant sure. Stevens told him she was leaving the Army. She never saw Jim walk independently or had any idea that she had set him on the path to recovery. And over the years, I've thought about her many, many times. I I'm not so naive to pretend that I'm the only soldier that she affected this way. As a matter of fact, she probably affected all of us this way, all of us that she worked with. But she was really important to me. And she always will be. Building on the foundation Lieutenant Stevens and his parents gave him, Jim Meade relearned how to walk and talk and made a nearly complete recovery Today, he is a clinical psychologist working in San Diego. He would like Lieutenant Stevens to share in his triumph. He would like to say thank you to the woman he will never forget. Keep going. Come on. Don't give up. Don't. If I Come saw on. her now, I don't know what I'd do. Cry, okay. maybe. Maybe just laugh a lot. I, I don't know. Come on. Uh, I thought about seeing her so many times. It's like she never left. I never left, whatever. Uh, I don't know what I'd do. I just know this, it's always been important for me that she knows that I'm okay. The morning after our broadcast, Jim Mee's 15 year search came to an end when he received a phone call from one of our viewers. I was watching TV and I saw Jim at the beginning of the program and I said to my family, I treated that fella when I was in the service. And the next remark was that they were looking for Lieutenant Stevens. And I thought, well, that was my maiden name. And at that point, I realized that this was going to be more than just a program to watch. On September 25th, nearly 21 years after they said goodbye, Jim and Karen reunited. Oh, it's good to see you. <laughs> what are you doing? Oh, I'm fine. You look wonderful. When Karen came to the door, I went and, um, if somebody else saw her, they might say that Karen's changed 200%. And my heart, Karen, hasn't changed a bit. <laughs> and I'm glad to tell her thank you. <laughs> the reunion today has been everything I expected it to be. It's, it will stand out as one of the most exciting days of my life. Uh, it's thrilling to see someone that has come back so far and made a success of their life. But a lot of people had a lot to do with Jim Mead's recovery. I was just a small part. It would be very difficult for me to put into words what this day has meant to me. It just makes the future that much brighter because I do know that now the dreams do come true. In a moment, we'll examine the extraordinary and controversial story of a strange craft that crashed in New Mexico in 1947. This Air Force base here in Roswell, New Mexico, was the center of a controversy back in 1947 that over 40 years later still remains unsolved. Remnants of a mysterious craft were found on a remote ranch and allegedly stored here in Hangar 84. To this day, there are many who believe it was a UFO. When we first heard of the incident at Roswell, we assumed it was just another UFO sighting that could be easily explained. A distant aircraft, an errant missile, 
or perhaps it was just a hoax. However, eyewitness accounts and disturbing evidence suggest that something strange happened here at Roswell, something that cannot be easily dismissed. July 2nd, 1947. A violent electrical storm sweeps over the desolate plain of south central New Mexico. At this time of year, these storms are almost nightly occurrences. At his remote ranch house, Mac Brazel patiently waits out the fury of the storm. Mac was a, he was just an old time cowboy, I guess you'd say. And he was pretty, pretty serious. If he told you something, you could pretty well depend on it. Apparently, Mac Brazel heard a thunderclap that night that somehow sounded different. The story is that Mac Brazel supposedly heard a loud crash at some point during the storm and didn't know if it was related to the storm or not. According to his son, Mac was on the range the next day looking to see which fields may have gotten precipitation the night before so they could move the livestock to those fields because the grass would be better there. And in his process of looking to see where the rain had uh, come down, he found the debris field spread out uh, near his ranch house. It was obvious that something had crashed in one of his pastures the night before. Whatever it was, was broken up beyond identification. The debris field was approximately three quarters of a mile long, maybe as much as two or 300 feet in width. Scattered along there were bits and pieces of material. We refused to call it metal because from the descriptions we have, it was more of a plastic-like material, very strong, very lightweight. Uh, the pieces of it were described as being three or four feet long, but as light as a feather, as thin as newsprint. There were metal beams that were slightly flexible, but very strong, and uh, it was spread out all over the field. Some of the metal pieces appeared to have strange qualities and unusual tensile properties. Later that day, Mac drove over to his closest neighbors, Floyd and Loretta Proctor, who lived 10 miles away. Afternoon, Floyd. Loretta. Hi, Mac. What brings you all the way out here? For Mac, he was <laughs> excited. Uh, you know, he was wanting somebody to go down and check it out. And we should have, and we didn't. Uh, take a look at that. Light a match to it, you see what I'm talking about. And he brought a little sliver of wood-looking stuff, and him and my husband tried to uh, cut it and burn it, but it, it wouldn't whittle and it wouldn't burn. Well, I admit that's pretty damn odd. Now, I would say it looked like plastic, but back then, why, you know, we didn't have plastic, and I guess it was more like a some kind of a lightweight wood. The Proctors urged Brazel to go to the authorities. The following Monday, Brazel reported his discovery to the sheriff, who informed nearby Roswell Army Air Base. That afternoon, Mac Brazel led two Army intelligence officers to the crash site. One of the officers was Major Jesse Marcel Sr., an experienced combat pilot whose primary duty in peacetime was to investigate air accidents. Why don't you just stay there, Mr. Brazel? 
Lieutenant? Even with his experience, Marcel was unable to identify what kind of craft it was. Marcel died in 1982, but before his death, he gave the following interview for a documentary film about UFOs. They were just fragments strewn all over the area, an area about three quarters of a mile long and several hundred feet wide. So we proceeded to pick up the parts. He says, I tried to bend this stuff. He says, it will not bend. I even tried to burn that. It would not burn. He says, that stuff weighs nothing. It's not any thicker than tinfoil in a pack of cigarettes. He says, we even tried making a dent in it with a 16-pound sledgehammer. Still no dent in it. One thing I was certain of, being familiar with all air activities, that it was not a weather balloon, nor an aircraft, nor a missile. It was something else of which we didn't know what it was. Late on the night of July 7th, Major Marcel drove back to Roswell, his car loaded down with the unusual remains found on the ranch. Before going on to the base, he stopped by his home. He wanted to show his family what he had found. When he came back to the house, he had had a bunch of wreckage with the with him at the time, and he brought the wreckage into the house, actually waking my mother and myself out so we could uh, view this because it's so unusual. It's about 2 o'clock in the morning, as I recall, right? And he spread it out so we could get some basic idea of what it looked like, what it was. Jesse Marcel Jr. was 11 it? years old at the time no and remembers the incident vividly. Where'd you find all this stuff? He is one of the few people still alive known to have handled pieces of the debris. Crashed. No, son, I don't know what this stuff is. We all were, were amazed by this uh, debris that was there. Probably because we didn't know what it was, you know, just the unknown. Look at this writing. What do you think that is? The most remarkable fragment was a short piece of I-beam, which was covered with strange symbols and embossed markings. Looks like some kind of hieroglyphics. This writing could be described as like hieroglyphics, Egyptian-type hieroglyphics, but not really. The symbols that were in the I-beams were more of a geometric-type uh, configuration in various designs. It had a violet-purple-type color, and was actually an embossed part of the metal itself. Years after this incident happened, we would talk privately among ourselves about what the possibilities of this, what this thing was. And I feel that we, well, I know that we came to the conclusion that it was not of earthly origin. If I had not actually held pieces of it in my hand, I would not think that it would be possible. But because I happen to see this, that's the only reason I believe it. Major Marcel took the wreckage to the Roswell base where he was stationed. Roswell was home to the 509th Bomb Squadron, the Air Force's sole atomic bomb group at the time. It was a closed base, and personnel stationed there required a high security clearance. The following morning, it is believed that some of the pieces were flown to Wright Field, near Dayton, Ohio, with a short stop at Carswell Air Base at Fort Worth, Texas. That same morning, Colonel William Blanchard, the commanding officer, made a crucial decision. He went public with the story of the discovery made by Mac Brazel. PIO's office, Lieutenant Hart speaking. Hart, this is Colonel Blanchard. Colonel Blanchard, yes, sir. What can I do for you, sir? Second Lieutenant Walter Hart was a public information officer for the 509th at the time. Flying disc. You heard me, Lieutenant. Colonel yes, Blanchard ordered days. him to issue a press release telling the country how the Army had found a flying saucer. I never questioned it. Yes, sir. In 1947, when a colonel told a first lieutenant to do something, the first lieutenant did that. I'm sure that had I asked uh, Colonel Blanchard to see it, he would have said no, and that would have been the end of the subject. Uh, there's a little bit of difference. It, you didn't have any democracy back in 1947 in the military establishment. The press release read in part, The many rumors regarding the flying disc became a reality yesterday when the intelligence office of the 509th Bomb Squadron 
was fortunate enough to gain possession of a disc through the cooperation of a local rancher. I took the releases into town, and that was one of the things that uh, Colonel Blanchard told me to do, take it into town, because if there's any validity to this, he didn't want the news media to feel that we had jumped over their heads and were not cooperating with them. That same day, it was reported that an engineer for the Soil Conservation Service made another remarkable discovery. Barney Barnett of Socorro, New Mexico, died in 1969, but he may have been the person who discovered what was perhaps the first positive proof that there was other life in our universe. Barney was just a real straightforward, just what you would call a real straight guy. He would, wouldn't tell you one story out of color or nothing. That's why I was really surprised when he related this information to me about uh, Crash Saucer. He told me that he'd come onto this spaceship. It was during the daytime. It was an oval shape, similar to what had been identified, you know, in different sightings and so on. And it had crashed and it had broken open. There was beings laying, about four beings laying on the ground, not in the, not in the spaceship, laying in the, on the ground. He did describe that the heads were larger than the bodies by proportion. And they had some type of clothing on that looked a little bit different, not exactly like our space suits or that sort of thing. But the four were laying on the ground. And uh, they were scattered not too far from the object. Barney told Verne that he reached the crash site about the same time as a group of archaeology students who had seen the wreckage from their nearby dig. The military had also apparently discovered the second crash site after an aerial search, but they arrived too late to secure the area. Sergeant, get those people out of there and in front of this Jeep now. Barney Barnett and the students had a clear and detailed look at the craft and its occupants. When the Army showed up, they immediately escorted these people from the scene. And then at that time, they gave them a warning not to relate any information to anybody. From that time on, Barney never mentioned it to anybody until the time that he told me about the thing. Ladies and gentlemen, it is my duty to inform you... All efforts to track down the members of the archaeology of the dig have been unsuccessful. This is a restricted area. And from this moment While the Barnett story has only been told secondhand, many believe there is just too much supporting circumstantial evidence to completely dismiss it. When he first told me, I was sort of flabbergasted. I didn't know what to say. But I believed it because of his integrity. I'd stake my life on his reliability. He would never concoct any story. That's why I believe it to be true. On July 8, 1947, newspapers across America published accounts that a UFO had supposedly crashed in New Mexico. That same day, according to some investigators, a cargo plane carrying the debris from the crash site arrived at an air base in Fort Worth, Texas. At almost the same moment, the Army received the news of a second crash site where alien bodies may have been found. Brigadier General Roger Ramey was the ranking commander of the 8th Army Air Force at Fort Worth. Within hours, Ramey's office issued a new press release stating that the material recovered in New Mexico was not a UFO, but in reality, the wreckage of a U.S. Army weather balloon. My dad said, obviously, it was a cover-up story. It was not a weather balloon. He was a little disturbed about that, but uh, he had his own uh, intelligence uh, classification, security classification to protect. He could not really go public with, hey, this is not the real thing. I mean, this is not a weather balloon. So he had to keep that to himself. 
but the UFO incident was still very much alive for Mac Brazel. At the time, rumors surfaced that Brazel was held at the Roswell base until after the new cover story had been circulated and generally accepted. In Roswell, Floyd Proctor and a friend saw Brazel, but he appeared to be unwilling or unable to acknowledge his friend. Floyd and a neighbor was in Roswell and saw Mac surrounded by the, some of the Air Force people. And they walked right by him and uh, Mac wouldn't speak to them. They, you know, kind of thought it was kind of, kind of funny. I guess really wondered what he'd got into. <laughs> and Mac, he, he wouldn't talk about it after he'd come back home. But he did say that if he ever found something else, he wouldn't report it. <laughs> By the time Brazel returned to his ranch, all traces of the Roswell incident had apparently been removed from the area and taken to Wright Field in Dayton, Ohio. Everything went to Wright Field. Uh, that's where the Air Technical Intelligence Center was. That was where they could make the studies. Subsequent to that, we think that the material has been sent elsewhere. We think one of the bodies has gone to Langley, CIA headquarters. We think another has gone to McDill, which is an Air Force base in Florida, where they have an aerospace medicine facility. We don't know where other stuff has gone. We think some of it is still left at right field. I think the reasons for the initial cover-up are pretty straightforward when you stop to think about it. Remember, this is two years after the worst war the planet had ever seen. You didn't think in terms of nice guys here to say hello kind of thing. They didn't know how to deal with them. What could you tell the public? It would have been totally irresponsible to say, by the way, we thought you'd like to know that there are alien visitors to planet Earth, that we can't do a darn thing to prevent them from flying over the country. We don't know what they want or where they're from, but we thought you'd like to know. For this group of people at that time to do that would have been totally irresponsible. In spite of the circumstantial evidence, there was no real proof to dispute the Army's contention that the wreckage was, in fact, a weather balloon. Then, more than 30 years later, UFO researchers obtained a document which many contend proves the Roswell incident actually occurred. In 1984, this top-secret document, known as the MJ-12 memo, was mailed anonymously to a UFO researcher. Operation Majestic 12, or MJ-12 as it's called, was a group of 12 people apparently established by the president to deal with the wreckage from Roswell and the whole problem that that created. What, how did these things work? Where did they come from? How can we get more information? How can we analyze the wreckage and the bodies and so forth? And how do we interact with the rest of society having that knowledge? The contents of the report stunned researchers. In part, it read, On 07 July, 1947, a secret operation was begun to assure the recovery of the wreckage. Aerial reconnaissance discovered that four small human-like beings had apparently ejected from the craft, about two miles east of the wreckage site. All four were dead. Civilian and military witnesses in the area were debriefed, and news reporters were given the effective cover story that the object had been a misguided weather balloon. The government has consistently refused to comment on the MJ-12 memo, and there is still no proof of its origin. But if we are to believe the MJ-12 document and the other accounts, then we must ask ourselves a fantastic question. Did our government, in 1947, really discover evidence that there is life in the universe outside our own atmosphere? Apart from Barney Barnett, there is only one man who has ever admitted to having seen these aliens. My husband, Oliver Henderson, otherwise known as Pappy in the Air Force, he was entrusted with many of this country's top secrets and they were safe with him. He never told anything that he wasn't supposed to. And 
Therefore, it was 34 years after this incident happened that I heard about it. Captain Pappy Henderson was the man who piloted the plane that took the first pieces of wreckage out of Roswell. In 1981, two years before he died, he told his wife that in spite of military denials, the Roswell incident really happened. My husband told me the bodies were small, smaller than human bodies. The heads were larger, and the eyes were rather sunken and uh, a little slanted. Clothing was of material unlike anything he'd seen before. They were strange. They were not, not of this earth. When my husband, who was a man of truth, who was uh, trusted with 29 different Army aircraft planes, first pilot, aircraft commander, tells me this story, I believed him. If this happened, it's the most significant event of the 20th century and probably the millennium. It would be akin to Columbus discovering the New World and Queen Isabella deciding not to tell the rest of the world about the discovery of the New World. More than 40 years have passed since that hot summer night when a violent thunderstorm swept over the Brazel Ranch. The military declared that the remnants found in that remote field came from a downed weather boat. But the people who actually saw and held the wreckage disagreed. Perhaps it was an experimental aircraft that the military wanted to keep top secret at all costs. But perhaps, just perhaps, it was something else. Next week on Unsolved Mysteries, we'll feature a special appearance by the director of the FBI, William Sessions, who will ask for your help in tracking down several of the most dangerous fugitives in the United States. We will visit Ambridge, Pennsylvania, where several parishioners of the Holy Trinity Church claim they witnessed a miracle above the altar during a religious service. And we will profile a clever con man who has targeted nudist camps across the country for his devious scams. For every mystery, there is someone, somewhere, who knows the truth. Perhaps it's you. Thank you.